Our text today is read from the second chapter of the second letter of St. Peter the Apostle to the Church, beginning with verse 1. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness and despise governments. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas the angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. A heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. There shall be false prophets in the church, even then as there was in Israel of old in the days of old, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Jesus said, Broad is the gate, and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. From the biblical point of view, there have always been a comparative few who follow the path of truth. Straight is the gate and narrow the way that leads unto life, said Jesus, and few there be, few there be that find it. One of the great confusions of today continues to be, as it has been in the past, the belief that religion connotates something good and acceptable in the eyes of God. Religion in and of itself is not necessarily good. It is one of man's oldest vices, and it is the means by which many heinous and ungodly things have been sanctified in the eyes of man. Some of the greatest sinners and mockers and those who work in the greatest opposition of truth have often functioned out of the religious world of the time. The dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees is sufficient to prove this point, even if one has not read the accounts of the wars between the prophets of the Lord and the religious world in the days of old, or how it was the religionists who opposed the apostles in the early days of the church. The religious world usually is out of harmony with the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and most of the people who think they are or pretend to be following God are actually following the broad way the religious world, and the false prophet. This according to the Bible. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. It takes discernment. It takes self-discipline. It takes sincerity. It takes diligence in the Word of God. It takes prayer. It takes association with others of sincere mind and earnest spirit. It takes association with knowledgeable leaders, who have proven themselves to be true to the word of God in order to avoid the error of the false prophets. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. The Greek word of polia here translated pernicious means ruinacious, the losing way, the damnable way, the destructive way, the dying way, the wasted way. Of course, here again is a deceit. There is a way, Proverbs 14, 12 says, that seems right unto a man. The many that follow the way of false religion and the way of the false prophets believe that they are on the right way. They believe that they are winning. They believe that by sheer force of numbers and bandwagon effects and psychology and peer pressure and so on, that by these criteria they are winning. But the Bible describes that way as the losing way, the wasted way, the dying way, the deceitful way. Many shall follow the way of destruction. Many shall go down that way of loss and wastedness. These are blind leaders of the blind, Jesus said, and they shall both fall into the pit. And Jesus offered the 
opinion of these false leaders in his day that they were corrupt, dead, self-deceivers, and deceiving others. And through covetousness, their motive is covetousness. Shall they with feigned words, fictitious words, sculpted words, molded, artificial words, this is what the Greek word translated feigned means, and that's their method, shall they make merch merchandise of you, and this Greek word merchandise is the, the word emporiana, and it's the word from which we get emporium or mart or marketplace. They'll merchandise you. That's the result. Covetousness, plastos, avarice, extortion, fraud, greed. That's what the Greek word plastos means. You may, the word may sound familiar. It should. It's the word from which we get the word plastic. Through covetousness, their motive, shall they with fictitious, artificial words, feigned words, their method, shall they make merchandise of you, the end result of their nefarious deeds. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not. These are busy in their mischief. They are hard at their work. They're not sleeping, they're not slumbering, they're on a mission and they're performing it with great diligence. But along with the diligence with which these false workers practice their mischief, the judgment of God is also busy. Their judgment slumbers not. They are destroying themselves. They are bringing damnation upon themselves and they're bringing damnation upon those who follow them. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. And they're getting what they deserve. They're getting what they earn. They are storing up wrath, as St. Paul said in the second chapter of Romans, against the day of wrath, or in other words, crimes to be faced in the day of judgment. Now, St. Peter wants to both warn and comfort the church. He doesn't want anyone who is a righteous person to go over and join the ungodly because he thinks the righteous are losing. He doesn't want anyone to be stampeded by this modern trend in the religious world. And so he talks about some situations in antiquity where evil was rampant on every hand, but the righteous were preserved. First, he talks about the righteous angels and the evil angels. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, God knew about and took care of the angels that sinned. He has them under control. They didn't get away with anything. They involved themselves in a great activity that had earth-shaking consequences and affected millions but never out of control, never out of the hand, the knowledge and the power of God. And in the days before the flood, the Bible says in the sixth chapter of Genesis that all flesh had corrupted itself before God. And God looked down and saw that the thoughts and the imaginations of their heart were only evil continually. One day in the not-too-distant future, we shall study the book of Genesis. It's one of the most fascinating studies in the Bible. And as we do, we will have time to dwell on this, that the world before the flood was a larger world, the seas were smaller, the land masses were greater than after the flood. How many people were in the world before the flood? Well, some people who study those things have it figured out that there were a lot more people in the world then than there are now. And the way they arrive at those conclusions is by taking the length of time that people lived and the size of their families and the years between Adam and Moses. I don't know if their calculations are correct or not. It isn't important to make this point that there were an awful lot of people in the world before the flood, and Noah was the only righteous man. You see, what part of Satan's tricks is the steamroller effect. It's not doing any good. It's no use. 
People are getting up in public places and saying Christianity is dying out, fundamentalism will be dead in 10 years, the old traditional gospel is no longer appealing to the young intellectual, and on and on and on. And what are they trying to do by that? They're trying to discourage and to dissuade those who still believe. You're losing out, you're in the minority, the trend is in our direction, and what is the bottom line? So you might as well give it up. It isn't doing any good. That's what they're trying to say by that. But God comes along through St. Peter in the scriptures and said, yes, but Noah was the only righteous man in his day, but Noah and his seven people, eight people including Noah, and that's a little biblical terminology, Noah the eighth person, his sons, their wives, and his wife and him, God saved eight people out of that world of billions in the days of the flood. Just one little family, but God knew about them. He knew how to deliver them, and he knew how to bring them through while destroying and bringing judgment upon the ungodly world. And God in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah delivered Lot in that wicked and vile society and made this comment, did St. Peter, making Sodom and Gomorrah an example unto those that should afterward live ungodly. Something that would amuse me if it wasn't so serious and so sober is the voices that one hears from time to time on the radios and the television and the newspapers and in the way places of life trying to claim that there's nothing in the Bible that condemns homosexuality. This is the most mindless comment that any intelligent person could ever make. In the 18th chapter of Leviticus, the Lord said plainly in the 22nd verse, you shall not lay with a man as with a woman, and you shall not lay with a beast, and a woman shall not stand before a beast to be intercoursed by it, because this is an abomination to the Lord. And he said in the 20th chapter of Leviticus in verse 13, and if any man lays with a man, or any woman with a woman, or any man or woman with a beast, they shall be killed, and their blood will be on their own hands. There's no guilt at all on the part of the person who took them out and stoned them. They're guilty. They did it to themselves. What an ignorant, unlearned, distorted, deliberately perverted claim that the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And St. Peter said, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah ought to be a lesson to you. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did he bring hail, fire, and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah and wipe it off from the earth? Because they were a bunch of perverts, a bunch of homosexuals. That's why he did it. And Lot, though he was a kind of a weak sister in a lot of ways, was a righteous man. And every day the Bible says that he saw and heard these things. He was vexed by it, vexed by it. One of the dangers of living in the world like we live in today is to get used to it and no longer be vexed. You don't dare do that. You don't have to go out and try to reform the world in order to be disgusted, repulsed, and vexed by what you see going on around you. You better be, because when you stop being, you're not a righteous man anymore. Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would reprove the world of judgment because they believe not on me and of sin. You can't be indifferent to the vile, contemptible, perverted, distorted things that go on around you. No righteous person has ever been, and no righteous person ever will be. This should be an example, but it isn't today. They thought they were all right in Sodom and Gomorrah because the politicians, the courts, the religionists were on their side. That's what they thought. They thought it didn't matter, that they were out of harmony with God. And they thought they were getting away with it because everybody was justifying them in what they were doing, and then the judgment of God fell upon them. Anarchy, blasphemy, and perversion are the classic symptoms, the classic symptoms, do you hear me, of a dying society. I wonder if you realize this. No society in history going clear back to the Medes and the Persians and Israel and way on back. No society in the history of this world has ever survived blasphemy against God 
anarchy against authority, and perversion which is a revolt against man's own nature. No society has ever done it. If this society in which we live survives these tendencies which are evident, which are commonplace in our society, we'll be the first in the history of the world to do it, but we won't do it. You can believe that. God, for one thing, said St. Peter, brought destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah as a warning to those who would afterwards live in the same way. But in the name of carnal freedom, our society today has turned a deaf ear to the law of God, and they're bringing judgment upon themselves. They're destroying their character. They're destroying their families, their children, their wives. They're destroying everything of value in the present, and oh, what they've got to look forward to in the future. But God delivered Lot. Lot was vexed in his soul every day by what he saw. He never learned to accept it. He never learned to live with it. That's a good example. That is the example that's being given to the church here by St. Peter concerning this. And I want you to remember that these things are brought in by false religionists and false prophets who justify them in the name of liberty and in the name of individual rights. The call that we're listening to here from St. Peter is not for us to reform the world or even to get rid of the false prophets. It's an individual call to you and to me not to listen to them, nor to be taken in by them. Don't think that the proliferation of evil and falseness and corruption all around you means that you're doomed to be negatively affected by it. It isn't true. It isn't true. God knows how to deliver the righteous out of temptations. And don't think that those simply because they're in the majority and quote unquote everybody's doing it are getting away with it because they're not. The Lord knows how to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished, and he will do that. And St. Peter said principally, here now we're talking about rebels, revolutionaries, and anarchists. The first and worst sin in the society of man is rebellion against authority. I know I've said that before. I will say it over and over and over again and again and again as often as it is timely, as long as God gives me breath. The first sin, the thing that Satan used with Eve to bring down the race, because it's the most delicious and native sin to man, is rebellion against authority. Man being in the image of God when he does not function properly like his nefarious leader, Satan, wants to ascend into the heavens and be like the Most High. He wants to be a god unto himself. He wants to rule his own life, and in this he is rebelling against the God who made him, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And this word dignity is the word doxa. It's the word we get doxology from, and it means honor, glory, praise. Those are in positions of honor. Those that God has established. Doesn't make any difference if we're talking about a civic leader if we're talking about a husband or a father, a leader in the church, it matters not. Those to whom God has given authority and honor, these speak evil of. They are anti-authoritarian. They are anarchists. No godly person, no godly person is a rebel, a revolutionary, or an anarchist. You say, no godly person is a revolutionary? I say, no godly person is a revolutionary. Revolution cannot be, cannot be justified by the scriptures. Revolution is a malfunction of fallen mortal man. Well, I know it's been called Christian in our society. It's been called Christian a lot of times. This, the devil called it Christian in the Garden of Eden, but it isn't Christian. And no godly person is a rebel. And no godly person is a revolutionary. And no godly person is an anarchist. All of these things are ungodly, 
and they're outside the kingdom of God. But it's a powerful appeal to fallen men. It sounds good when it's properly couched by a false prophet who can speak these great swelling words of vanity and sell a sow's ear for a silk purse, and gullible souls are taken in by it. They believe it. They should not believe it. It isn't true. I want to leave you today with this thought that the chief characteristic of false prophets and the worst sin in the human race is this, that they despise to be governed and to be ruled. They want to make up their own rules. They are self-willed, and they have no fear of God, and they have no fear of God-given authority.